Hello everyone, this is Sean Taylor, Field Application Scientist Manager for GenScript in North America. This video will cover a short tutorial to explain the mechanism, infection rate, and tools for monitoring the novel coronavirus 2019. Other synonyms that are used uh, routinely in the scientific community for coronavirus 2019 is COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, so the second coronavirus that causes SARS, and then 2019 NCOV. So all of these are synonyms that, that people use interchangeably for the same coronavirus that initiated late 2019 in China. So the first um, step in discussing any virus is looking at its structure. And I'm, do, and I'm going to do this very briefly. There are a lot of articles published which, uh, which describe in, in much more detail and, and much more uh, eloquently the structure of the virus. But to, to, to just briefly overview, the key features in COVID-19 are this spike glycoprotein. This is very important, and I'll discuss this in the next slide. There are a number of glycoproteins that are on the surface of the coronavirus, and they all play different roles and functions. There's also the nucleocapsid proteins, which are inside the uh, nuclear envelope of, uh, inside the, uh, the, the coat of the virus. And then there's also RNA. And the RNA is used by the virus to replicate itself once it, in, it in, is engulfed, is, is, um, is uh, endocytosed into the host cell. So how do we, uh, how does the virus transmit? How does, what is the mechanism of action of COVID-19? So this image is an image of the virus and this image is an image of the host cell. So COVID-19 likes to bind by its spike glycoprotein. So this protein here, the spike glycoprotein is how the virus binds to the host cell. And, it re and this spike glycoprotein very specifically recognizes on host cells this blue protein here. It's not blue, it's just colored blue here. And that's called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. So this has been identified as a key SARS coronavirus receptor. And it plays a, a protective role in SARS. So in SARS pathogenesis, and this was also published recently uh, in Nature um, by Zhu P. et al. So the spike glycoprotein very specifically binds to the ACE2 receptor on the host cells, and then the host cells endocytose the virus inside the cell, and then the virus replicates itself uh, within the cell. And when it replicates, it eventually leaves the cell, and you can see the virus here kind of exocytosing. It's coming out of the cell after it's replicated itself, and now we have more virus made from the host cell. Now, ACE2 is important to understand because this receptor is, provides protection from deep lung injury. So it's in the, it's in the cells deep inside the lung. So when COVID-19 binds inside deep in the lung to ACE2, the virus and the receptor, so both of these, the virus and the receptor itself, are internalized into the cell. So you lose these receptors as the virus binds to them and, and takes them inside the cell. <clears throat> the reduction of ACE2 can ultimately lead to pneumonia by a variety of mechanisms. So I'm not going to go through all this. But ACE2 provides a protective role, and, and we need ACE2 to protect ourselves uh, from a variety of, of, of problems that can happen inside the lung. ACE2, that receptor, is not only in the deep lung where, where we see symptoms of the virus with pneumonia and all these things, but we also it's also expressed highly in the heart, intestine, and kidney which can also potentially lead to illness in these tissues with COVID-19 infection. So there's a lot of work being done on this to assess how COVID-19 infection affects not just the lungs, which are where we know the, the major symptoms are, but also in, the other, in, in these other tissues. Spike glycoprotein, which is here in red, 
contains two subunits. It contains the S1 subunit in yellow, and this is the unit that binds to AC2, and then it contains an S2 subunit. So these are important when we talk about um, detection of, of the virus, and we'll talk about this in, in the coming slides. Okay, so now let's talk about trans transmission rate and the requirement to monitor the disease. So with viruses, we always use a term called the R0, okay? And we've seen this in movies, uh, pandemic and other movies. So the R0 is, is the transmission, effectively the transmission rate. And for um, COVID-19, um, a recent study was, was performed um, in China published in the Lancet Journal um, by, uh, by Korshrasky et al. And they determined that without social distancing, so with just the virus running rampant through, through China, through uh, Wuhan, that the R0 was approximately two. So this is without any, any social distancing, any laws in place to prevent people from interacting with each other. So with an R0 of two, what that means is that a single individual can infect two individuals. So imagine one individual infects two and then those two individuals affect two more people and so on and so forth. So you end up with this exponential increase, this doubling of infected people each time the new infected people interact with other individuals. And the rate of infection is approximately six days. So every six days, there's a doubling of the amount of people that are infected if there, if there are no rules or laws in place to prevent people from interacting with each other. So the interpretation, therefore, would be that without social distancing, without any rules in place, one person can infect two people over a six-day period. And the following six days, those people each infect two more people for a total of four people. And within two months, that single person that started off the infection will lead to a thousand people being infected. So that's pretty serious because that, that, that you know, causes a large dramatic increase in the amount of infection in the society. What they also did though, Kershaw et al., because then China implemented social distancing, right? They, they closed Wuhan borders, they made people stay in their homes, and they, and they determined that the R0 with social distancing was, was one. So this means that with social distancing, one person only affects one other person over six days. So within the same two month period, there isn't this exponential increase of infection. There will only be a few people infected over a two month period. And effectively the virus can, can just be alleviated, can be, can be rectified by social distancing. So that's what, that's what this study uh, showed. So this underlines the requirement to monitor the number of global cases because we need to be able to assess the effect of social distancing on this R0 number. Because if the R0 is one or lower, then we're, then we're effectively eradicating the virus. We're effectively keeping the virus under control in society. But if, as soon as the R0 is above one, then we, have, then we can implement, have this exponential increase of the virus and infection can run rampant through society and affect our healthcare systems and our economy and everything. Okay, so, so diagnostics, what do we have? There are, there are a variety of diagnostics out there. There are disease diagnostics and then there are virus detection uh, methodologies. So for disease diagnostics, these can be, be uh, as simple as routine blood tests for increased uh, liver enzymes, uh, muscle enzymes, myoglobin, so a variety of, of markers that are in the blood that would denote infection. There are also chest imaging, so you can look at uh, multiple patchy shadows, interst interstitial changes, so this is all lung, uh, lung effects, so you can see pathology in the lungs from viral infection. Now, of course, these blood tests and chest imaging are, are, are quite expensive because it requires going to a hospital, nurses, doctors, equipment, all required to be able to examine you. There are other ways to look at, these are more molecular methods, 
so nucleic acid detection, and this is this is one that that's that's used a lot and was used a lot for coronavirus. So the first step in the process of nucleic acid detection is determining determining the nucleic acid sequence of the virus itself, and that was already done in China. So they determined the sequence, and by knowing the sequence of the RNA inside the virus, then they can develop kits to detect the RNA by a technology called real-time PCR or isothermal PCR. So these are, these are methods that are very quick and easy. Uh, they, they require uh, taking a blood sample from the patient or, or sputum or, or um, a variety of fluids that, that, that are secreted from, from, from patients. And then they can detect uh, whether the viral uh, RNA is, is in their um, secreted fluids and that would indicate infection. And it's a very sensitive test. This, this permits you to detect infection very early. There are serology detection methodologies as well. And this is, this is related to when our own immune system starts to battle the virus. So when our immune system battles the virus, we generate antibodies uh, against the virus itself. And those antibodies then start to circulate in the blood. And, and those antibodies can be detected um, in a variety of, of means. One of them is called ELISA, and those kits uh, can, be, can be made and then used to detect circulating antibodies that we've generated. The advantage of serology detection is that you can detect the antibodies even after the virus has been eradicated by the immune system. So you'll know if a person has, been, has already been infected. With nucleic acid detection, once the virus has been eradicated, there, there will be no more nucleic acids, no more RNA from the virus in, in the uh, secreted fluids, and you won't know if the person's been infected. So, <clears throat> timing for molecular tests are important, th therefore. And, uh, for testing antibodies in, uh, in, in patient blood, it's a good choice for rapid, simple, and highly sensitive uh, diagnosis of the virus. But again, um, antibodies for the virus are only made after infection has happened. So it's, it can take several days, up to five to ten days, for antibodies to be generated. So it's widely accepted that IgM, if we look here on a timeline, we can see that the very initial um, detection methodology immediately after infection would be the viral RNA, and that would be by qPCR. So if you really want to know quickly if someone's been infected early on in the infection, then qPCR is the best way to go to detect the viral RNA that's circulating, because there's going to be a lot of virus in that patient at that stage. But then as time goes by, we generate antibodies, and then we can detect these antibodies later on. So after, vir after the virus has gone away, then we can still detect these antibodies because these antibodies stay with us uh, essentially forever so that we can combat the virus the next time uh, there's, a, there's a, a viral outbreak. So it's widely accepted that IgM provides the first line of defense during viral uh, infections. And then uh, IgG uh, uh, is a later response, even later after infection, that can also be detected. So these are antibodies that can be, that can be detected post-infection. Nucleic acid detection for SARS-CoV only gives a positive result when the virus is still present, as I mentioned, and is also dependent on sampling the appropriate tissues or fluids. Remember, uh, this is a deep lung infection, so it's important to swab way back in the throat uh, to assure that the shedding of the virus has come out of the deep lung to the back of the throat. It, it may not be in the saliva um, early on in the infection, and it may not be in other body fluids. So it's, it can, if the sampling is not done properly, then you can easily get some false uh, negative results with, uh, with nucleic acid detection and qPCR. Antibody tests can confirm the infection, so, that, so they can be used as a, as a complementary test in case uh, the sampling wasn't done properly or in case there's false negatives. 
the antibody tests uh, can confirm infection and, uh, and would give a positive result even if a PCR test is, uh, of a suspected case is negative. So um, I'm not going to go through this slide in great detail. This is just to, sh just to show that the, vi the virus was sequenced and there are a variety of, of, uh, of targets in the virus, genes, that have been used to, to make kits for qPCR to detect the virus. So ORF1AB, E, and N, these are all um, regions of the viral genome that are being used to detect the virus uh, by nucleic acid detection. So um, GenScript has come up with, uh, with a few kits um, to do this. We have a one-step kit which will detect, uh, as, as I mentioned before, the ORF1AB, uh, N, and E. So these kits are all available with primers. So this is very quick, easy detection of the virus available to detect um, um, the uh, presence or absence of virus early on in infection. There are also uh, duplex assays where, where, where these kits can, can detect two of these targets in one test, uh, in one sample. So this is great if the patient has very little sample or if we're very early on the infection, we don't have very much sample, so we want to detect more than one, or just as a cross test to assure that if one is positive, that the other target is positive so that we're, we get a much more, um, much more strength in the confirmation that the virus is there. And again, these kits are available from GenScript. For serology diagnosis, We've also generated some ELISA kits to detect the IgG and IgM. And these kits are, are, are on the market. They're available. Um, they're all here for, for looking at IgG and IgM analysis from patient um, um, blood samples. So the, the antibodies are circulating in the blood. It's a simple blood test. And then you can detect either a weak positive or strong positive, dependent on the point at which the infection occurred. So this is a good way to cross-reference testing with uh, qPCR. So why, uh, why should we use uh, serology tests as well as qPCR? Because qPCR sounds so great because you can detect it early. Well, the reason why you want to use serology tests as well is because we want to trace the overall infection within the population from those who have recovered. Remember, qPCR will not detect the virus if, it, if it's not in the bloodstream. And for recovered patients, there will be no virus left but the antibodies against the virus will be there. So serology tests are important so that we can understand how many people have actually been infected. Um, so they can be used to also confirm infections. If, if the qPCR test has been done, then a serology test can be used to also help confirm that that patient is in fact positive. And uh, it's, it's good as an accurate and simple uh, point of care test because qPCR requires several steps and kits and equipment. Serology tests are much more simple. They're easier to run. So um, in this case, we had uh, several patients that were tested. And all we're showing here is data from a standard curve. So this is, this is a recombinant uh, S1 protein that was diluted, just to show where how sensitive the kit can go, how much dilution you can use. Before you're able, before you're not able to get a good signal from the ELISA test, and with actual patient samples from plasma, we recommend to to not go below a one in one thousand dilution of the plasma samples to get a good signal for the IgG and IgM tests. Uh, one in a hundred is actually even better, but you could go as low as one in a thousand and still get um, a signal that is above um, the um, the healthy controls. So these are the healthy control signals. So the entire spectrum of proteins and assays for COVID-19 are assembled on the GenScript website. You can click here at genscript.com slash virus underscore antigens. And here we've assembled 
the full list of available proteins and assays, the N protein, all of the S proteins, and some fusion proteins, all available or very, very soon to be available, as well as the ACE2 receptor protein, antibodies, and the two ELISA detection kits, which are currently available. So if you want to quickly detect, the ELISA kits are, are available. And for assembling assays, all the proteins are available on the website. We also have a services platform, which can provide customized proteins for producing exotic assays or tests or research. So we have of course, the qPCR detection assay, either singleplex or duplex, as well as plasmids and proteins and antibodies for COVID-19 research that can be customized to the desire of whatever research or kits that you are planning on producing. So we hope that you stay safe in this new age of social distancing. Let's reduce that R0 down to one or lower so that we can move on past COVID-19.